Pretty much any time you operate on a data set in Foundry, Apache Spark is working behind the scenes. Understanding some basic Spark concepts can go a long way towards processing your data more efficiently. This is especially true of the topic we'll be covering in today's video, partitions. Partitions are the most basic unit of Spark computation. You can think of a partition as a group of rows or a subset of your data frame. In this example, four partitions are formed out of a seven-row data frame. Spark is a distributed computing system, so it can operate on data partitions in parallel. A transformation on a data partition is called a task, and each task generally takes place on one Spark core. In this example, we have two executors with two cores each. This means that a transformation can be performed on all four of the data partitions simultaneously. For instance, if we wanted to apply a filter to this data frame, partition one's rows would be filtered independently of the rows in partition two. Optimal partitioning in Spark strikes a balance between read performance and write performance. Too many partitions can slow down read time and burden Spark with creating more tasks than are necessary to process the data, which could cause an out-of-memory error on the driver. On the other hand, too few partitions can mean that Spark's parallelism is not being fully harnessed, which can lead to long computation and write times. Overly large partitions can even cause executor out-of-memory errors. Spark generally does a good job of splitting data into partitions to ensure parallelism and efficient computing. However, when dealing with very large data sets, it can occasionally be useful to manually adjust partitions to ensure optimal performance. As a rule of thumb, 128 megabytes is a good size for a data partition when dealing with data sets above one gigabyte. You can calculate the number of partitions that your data set should ideally have by dividing the dataset size in megabytes by 128 megabytes. More advanced partition optimization techniques include bucketing and hive partitioning. We don't have time to cover those topics today, but if you'd like to see them in the future video, please let us know in the comments. Now let's walk through how to determine the number of partitions that are currently in your dataset. Navigate to the Details tab, and then look at the About section. Here, you can see that this dataset has 100 files, which means that the dataset is split into 100 partitions. The size of this dataset is about 26 gigabytes. So to do the calculation for the ideal number of partitions, take 26,000 megabytes and divide it by 128 megabytes. That comes out to about 200 partitions, twice the number that this dataset currently has. So let's navigate over to the Files section to see how large these partitions are. Here you can see they're about 250 megabytes each, which is twice that ideal number. To wrap things up, I'll talk through the methods you can use for changing the way your data is partitioned. Note that you should only use these methods if you really understand the data. Otherwise, manually repartitioning your data could easily make your transform less efficient. Coalescing combines existing partitions into a smaller number of partitions. This means that no shuffling of data occurs, but as a result, the data may become more skewed after coalescing. Additionally, coalescing could reduce parallelism, since fewer partitions mean that there are fewer tasks that can be run concurrently. One place I've seen coalescing come in handy is in reducing the number of files in an incremental build's output when there are millions of very small files. With repartitioning, you can specify any number of partitions. Repartitioning can be useful for balancing out skewed data, but it requires a potentially expensive shuffling operation. I've seen repartitioning come in handy in the case of an exploding join, where slicing the data into more tasks prevented an out-of-memory error. It's worth noting that the partition count can change throughout a transform due to operations that cause a shuffle, such as joins and aggregations. This means that you need to be really careful when manually repartitioning. If you'd like to know more about shuffling, check out the next video in this series.